night, charging ahead on Obamacare repeal. That amendment doesn't have enough support, though, to go forward. Uh, so, so, so are you doing whip counts now? Paying drug users not to reproduce and the new frontier of carbon capture. The two main rival leaders in Libya's years-long conflict have agreed to a ceasefire following talks held near Paris. They also committed to work toward holding presidential and parliamentary elections soon, though no specific date was set. The meeting between UN-backed Prime Minister Fayez al-Saraj and military commander Khalifa Haftar was hosted by French President Emmanuel Macron. Je crois profondément que la guerre civile n'a rien d'inéluctable. Et par le dialogue, la paix peut l'emporter. Dengue fever has killed at least 296 people in Sri Lanka in an unprecedented outbreak. The mosquito-borne disease has infected more than 100,000 people in the country this year alone. Health authorities say recent monsoon rains and poor sanitation have helped create ideal conditions for mosquitoes. But a Red Cross official said they're also confronting a new strain of the virus that is hard to fight off. The Journal of the American Medical Association published a study today that looked at the brains of 111 former NFL players, and it showed that 110 of them had CTE, a degenerative disease believed to be caused by multiple blows to the head. Symptoms include memory loss, confusion, depression, and dementia. Along with the former NFL players, researchers also examined high school and college players' brains and found that 87% of all the study's subjects had CTE. There's no more debate about whether or not this is a problem in football. In a rare show of bipartisanship, the House voted overwhelmingly, 419 to 3, to pass new sanctions against Russia and to limit President Trump's ability to lift them. The sanctions target Russia for its interference in the American presidential election, and also hit Iran and North Korea for their weapons programs. It's still not certain that Trump will sign the bill, which includes a provision requiring congressional approval of any move to get rid of the sanctions. After bashing his own attorney general in interviews and on Twitter, President Trump continued to voice his displeasure with Jeff Sessions, even as he denied leaving him twisting in the wind. I told you before I'm very disappointed with the attorney general, uh, but we will see what happens. Time will tell. Time will tell. Senator John McCain, battling brain cancer, returned to the Senate to vote in favor of opening debate on Obamacare repeal. But then he took the floor to deliver a stern parting warning, aimed particularly at his own Republican majority. Stop listening to the bombastic loudmouths on the radio and television and the internet. To hell with them. I will not vote for this bill as it is today. It's a shell of a bill right now. We all know that. We tried to do this by coming up with a proposal behind closed doors in consultation with the administration, then springing it on skeptical members, trying to convince them that it's better than nothing. That it's better than nothing? Whether or not we are of the same party we are not the president's subordinates. We are his equal. But McCain's plea won't mean much for how the process plays out. With the Arizona senator's I vote secured, Vice President Mike Pence broke a 50-50 tie to open the next assault on the Affordable Care Act over unified Democratic opposition. But even as they move forward, Senate Republicans still can't agree on what repeal should look like. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has a plan to thread the needle, jam a modified repeal bill through the Senate, and then likely move it to what's called Conference Committee, where Senate and House Republicans would try to work out their differences and craft some kind of consensus proposal. That finished product, called the Conference Report, would then go back to each chamber for a final vote. It leaves a huge number of challenges ahead, but it may be the GOP's only option. Alexandra Jaffe explains. Mitch McConnell is going to give a bunch of Republicans the chance to offer up their preferred versions of a health care bill. But what he expects to be able to actually pass is a plan that's way smaller in scope. 
It could be as simple as removing some of the Obamacare provisions that Republicans hate most. Examples. Getting rid of the law's tax on people who choose not to buy insurance, known as the individual mandate, the requirement that employers provide insurance, and the medical device tax. If it does pass, that bill, which people are calling the skinny repeal, could go to the conference committee, where members of the House and Senate would hammer out the rest of the details behind closed doors. Near term, this is a smart move. It takes a lot of the political pressure off of Republicans by giving them more time. It lets them look like they've earned a win without actually getting much. But just repealing those taxes while leaving the rest of Obamacare in place would result in massive premium increases, according to the Congressional Budget Office. And skinny repeal doesn't even touch one of the biggest points of conflict for Republicans, Medicaid, which is how 74 million people in this country access health care. And it leaves us pretty much back where we started, with no Republican consensus on how to fix health care overall. Pretty much everyone knows that skinny repeal would be just a first step. But whether McCain's call for a return to the way things used to be done, with at least a semblance of bipartisan input, will have any impact is an unresolved question. I talked to one of the Senate's most conservative members about what he thinks could happen next. Can we chat about the skinny repeal plan? Does it do enough to bring down premiums or fix any of the issues with health care? We need to go forward. Um, the final outcome is still unclear. We're going to have robust amendments on the floor of the Senate if we pr proceed to the bill. And, and I believe we can get to yes throughout this entire process. It's been rocky. But the key to getting to yes is focusing on lowering premiums. And I think the key to doing that are really two amendments that I introduced. One, the Consumer Freedom Amendment, which is critical to unifying Republicans and getting the job done. The Consumer Freedom Amendment protects your freedom as you, the consumer, to choose what health care you want uh, without the federal government mandating what you have to buy. That amendment and, doesn't have enough support, though, to go forward. Uh, so, so, so are you doing whip counts now? <laughs> uh, so you still think you can pass it? I believe it will be passed into law. So just a repeal of those taxes that we're talking about when we talk about the skinny repeal is not enough for you? I, look, if that's an initial bill that gets to conference, that's a step in the journey. What people care about is the final product. And, mm -hmm. and, and what I'm interested in is results. It's what the American people expect of us. They've given Republicans majorities in both houses and the White House. We got to deliver. As other migration routes have been all but sealed off, Italy has become the primary point of entry to Europe in the Mediterranean. And the humanitarian crisis in Italy, in sheer numbers, is even worse than in neighboring Greece. This year, more than 93,000 people have been rescued by boats in Italian waters, an increase of 17% over the same period last year. Some 9,000 have landed so far this month. But most people arriving in Italy are not refugees fleeing war in the Middle East. Just 2% are from Syria. The majority are considered economic migrants, mostly from West African countries like Nigeria and Guinea. That distinction is important because the term refugee is legally defined and comes with legal status. But economic migrants, who may face extreme poverty or violence at home, often don't qualify for asylum. Caroline Motoresi Tehrani reports from Sicily. Italy is one of the last EU countries still welcoming migrants with open arms. And earlier today at the port of Pozzallo, a former fishing trawler operated by a European NGO brought 419 migrants to shore. These people were rescued two days ago off the coast of Libya. They're going to be taken to a detention centre where they'll be held for 48 hours or up to a month, just like 56,000 other migrants that have already arrived in Sicily this year. How easy was it for you to get work when you first came to Sicily? I came to Sicily well, since right from the one. I have no working. I don't have a job. So I'm just managing some time, go to farm work to survive. Italy is in one of the worst economic downturns it's faced in years, and Italians are already starting to push back against the number of migrants the country is having to absorb into its already shaky economy. We asked the mayor of Sicily's capital, Palermo, how concerned he is about the migrant crisis. All the mayors having financial problems, they do not protest. They know that the migrants are human beings, having human rights. 
Italy shouldn't be dealing with this problem alone. There was a burden sharing agreement in 2015 to relocate migrants throughout EU member states, but it's been slowly falling apart. Earlier this month, the European Commission threatened Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic with legal action for refusing to take in refugees from Italy. My opinion is that we have not to refuse the migrants. We have to refuse to have inside the European Union the state who will not respect the rights of the migrants. Because the European Union does exist in name of respect of human rights. At a crisis meeting this month, the European Union offered $40 million to Italy to help it deal with the crisis. Italy's EU ambassador has threatened to close Italy's ports if the EU doesn't offer more concrete help. Today in Rome, officials are meeting to discuss a code of conduct placed on NGOs who are operating in the search and rescue zones and are delivering migrants to ports like this one. What do you know about this code of conduct? I mean, if we come across a rubber boat that's sinking, uh, we have a legal obligation to react to that and save them. And also, there is already a voluntary uh, code of conduct in place since last year that most of the uh, NGOs have signed up to. Um, I know that our organizations, the organizations we work with and work alongside, are professional and have done a really good job um, picking up a lot of the burden that's been left behind as the EU has pulled back its dedicated search and rescue. But as Italy and the rest of the EU keep fighting over what to do with the migrant crisis, the boats still keep coming. Today, over a thousand migrants arrived in Sicily alone. Since the 1970s, at least 45 states have prosecuted women for using drugs while pregnant. Alabama has one of the country's strictest laws on the subject. It's been used to prosecute women even before they've given birth. And one woman in Alabama is on a crusade to keep drug users from getting pregnant in the first place. Everybody knows a drug addict, unfortunately. So if you know anybody who's using drugs that could get pregnant, we'll pay them to use birth control. Okay. That's what we do. Thank you. Barbara Harris thinks day. drug addicts shouldn't have children, and she's using cash incentives to make sure they don't. Nothing positive comes to a drug addict who gives birth to eight children that are taken away from her. This is a win-win for everybody. Her non-profit, Project Prevention, pays addicts and alcoholics $300 if they get sterilized or put on long-term birth control. Swing it wide. It says no left turn here. You're turning, you're turning right. I'm going this way. Oh, I thought she wanted me to go that way. Over the last 20 years, she's traveled the country in her branded RV and paid 7,000 people to give up their fertility. Most of them are women. She launched Project Prevention after she adopted four babies in four years, each born to the same drug-addicted mother. You've been doing this work for nearly 20 years now. How have things changed? When I first started, the drug of choice was crack. Um, now it's switched and now it's meth and heroin and a lot of prescription drugs. But nothing else has changed. Drugs are still just as bad. Women are still having numerous children. Foster care is still overloaded. Hundreds of thousands of kids are still in need of homes. The birth control she offers isn't condoms and pills. It's IUDs, implants and sterilization. Those who choose sterilization get a lump sum after the procedure. Those who go for less permanent options are paid in smaller installments. Thousands of women have taken her money in exchange for permanent sterilization, entirely legally. Project Prevention itself doesn't sterilize addicts, just pays them. Harris leaves the procedures to doctors. She gets anything up to half a million dollars in private donations every year. I think if there's anything that everybody can agree on, the left, the right, and everybody in the middle, it's, it's not okay to abuse children. You think having a child when you're, when you're drinking and taking drugs is child abuse? Yes. Well, they say don't even drink caffeine when you're pregnant, so I don't know how meth could be good for a baby. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimates 4.7% of women aged 15 to 44 use drugs while they're pregnant and more than 32% of all children placed in foster care were removed from home because of their parents' drug or alcohol use. Harris made the nine-hour trip to Mobile when she heard about a local woman who'd been imprisoned for taking heroin while pregnant. She doesn't want drug users sent to jail. She wants them on long-term or permanent birth control. How is doing what you do without looking at the social causes that create a situation like this, how is that any more than a, than a Band-Aid on a huge problem? But it's not a band-aid on the problem we're dealing with. We're solving the problem we're dealing with. 
we're preventing women who are strung out on drugs and alcohol from conceiving a child. Harris targets areas where she thinks addicts will congregate, like cheap motels, liquor stores, and methadone clinics. It's not even 11 a.m. when she meets 33-year-old Alicia Robinson, and Robinson already seems high. She has seven children and used during all her pregnancies. Sometimes you might pull up on a John, a John just pull up on you, and he just might be that one that has a fantasy that don't like to use condoms. There it is. I know. I have seven kids. Can you still get pregnant? So, have you thought about getting on birth control? Yeah. Well, then you need to do it. Let's do it right now. Uh, we don't do the birth control, <laughs> but you need to do it. I got him. Okay? Okay, because that's going to prevent the next heartache, yeah. right? Yeah. One less worry. One less worry. It doesn't bother you that by virtue of what you do, you're targeting a specific section of the population? No. Of people. No. It doesn't bother you at all? No. A disproportionate number of people who use your services aren't white how do you respond to the claim that you are socially engineering? For somebody to hear about what we do and think we're only paying people of color is very racist because they're assuming that all drug addicts are people of color, and that is not true. Is it really informed consent when they're in a chaotic situation? That's between them and the doctor. He has to decide whether he thinks they are able to get birth control. Nobody has a right to force feed any child drugs and then deliver a child that may die or may have lifelong illnesses. Nobody has that right. I think it was a, some kind of flyer or something. And all I remember is the number was 1-888-30-CRACK. <laughs> a memorable number. Yeah, for someone, yeah. He's an addict, yeah. I can't forget it. Tina Boyd is a project prevention client who was sterilized eight years ago. She's been clean since 2012, but most of her life has been spent using drugs, including when she was pregnant with her sons, Joey and Michael. Do you think that your drug use has affected them long term? I know it has. It's affected Joey. In what way? He has a receptive and cognitive delay. He doesn't under understand a lot. They said that he'll probably have to live with someone the rest of his life. Which hopefully will be me. I love you. He's my baby. After Joey was born, Boyd took Harris's cash in exchange for getting an IUD. But then Boyd decided to have another baby. After Michael was born addicted, she went back to Project Prevention to get paid for sterilization. Do you ever have any second thoughts? No. Not even when your younger son says he wants a little sister? Could you have it and then I'll give it back to you? I can't, I can't be him. I can't, I can't, I can't. Look, I'm there, I can't. <laughs> Just listening to you, it makes it makes me feel like you you have, you don't believe in, in yourself. I believe in my limitations. God forbid, if you guys had brought drugs with you, I can't say that I wouldn't have sniffed them out. You know, and I don't want to live like that. I don't want my children to have to live like that. Would you like the ability to be able to do things differently? Oh, God, yes. Are you kidding? Yes, everything. 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 Barbara Harris's greatest impact is in perpetuating really destructive and kind of cruel myths about pregnant women and their children. Lynn Paltrow heads up the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. She's been a critic of Barbara Harris's work for over 20 years. You're assuming every woman that's a drug addict is looking for treatment. They're not. Paltrow works with Mary Barr, a social justice advocate, former addict, and mother who used drugs when she was pregnant with both her kids. I have two children who are incredibly healthy, were born healthy. They're 26 and 25, and they're very amazingly successful. If you had met Barbara during the height of your addiction, what would you have thought of that offer? I would have taken it because I, $300, you know, at all at once, you know, that meant uh, for me, three nights of sleeping indoors. Paltrow says it's the world the children of addicts are born into that leaves them so disadvantaged, not the substances they were exposed to. When you talk to the medical researchers, the great news is that none of the criminalized drugs cause unique, permanent, terrible damage. 3% of all women give birth to babies that have what are called serious birth defects. None of that has anything to do with the criminalized drugs. Do you think Barbara Harris has a quite a static view 
of addicts and addiction, that once you're an addict, you're always an addict. Yes, and, uh, and she's not the only one. When somebody was telling me I couldn't be a productive mother and that my children would be born, you know, disabled or something, uh, I, I mean, wow, I believe that. The biggest threats to our children have nothing to do with what any individual woman did or didn't do. It has to do with poverty, the lack of access to health care. It has to do with the stress created by racism. Do you not think that addicts might deserve a second chance and that by promoting sterilization, you're denying them a second chance? Well, we don't promote sterilization. That's their choice. They got strung out. They decided they wanted $300 to sterilize themselves. And if it's a decision they regret, it was a decision they made, just like prostituting and ending up with AIDS. Because I watched how my children suffered and had to withdraw from drugs when they were born. So no, I wasn't thinking about the women, these poor women. I was thinking my poor children. This is all very straightforward for you, isn't it? It's very simple. To me, it is. Nobody who disagrees with what we're doing has yet to give me a logical, rational reason why a drug addict or an alcoholic should get pregnant. And I always say to them, if you believe that strongly that these women should keep conceiving children, then you should step up and adopt the next one born. But most of the people who have a problem with what we're doing, they would never consider adopting one of these children. So if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. A new climate study out today estimates that significant human carbon emissions actually began more than 100 years before scientists previously thought. That could move the tipping point for irreversible temperature rise even closer. One of the primary causes of human-driven climate change is industrial farming, but a new form of agriculture could reverse that trend. Underwater groves of carbon-eating kelp. So you can see, it's way down below the surface. It's about eight feet. Okay, so here's our kelp. This, you know, for a fisherman, it's kind of weird to grow plants. Yeah. But uh, this is the future. Good. So, fertilizer. Yeah. Fertilizer, and then you get the good food. We should be chanting. Fertilizer, food. A few years ago, Brent Smith lost his oyster business to Hurricane Sandy. The storm wiped him out. So the lifelong fishermen started looking for a crop that could withstand a storm and landed on kelp, a type of seaweed that's popular in Asia but that hasn't caught on in America. Today, he spends most of his time evangelizing the crop he says could feed the planet and heal our oceans. What are the benefits of kelp farming specifically? We soak up five times more carbon than land-based plants. Okay. We filter nitrogen out of the water column. We function as an artificial reef, so all these species can come and hide and thrive. We're storm surge protectors for lo local communities. Does that help prevent ocean acidification or help kind of mitigate it? Yeah, so too much carbon in our waters is creating acidification. So we capture that carbon and essentially sell it as food. Do you get as much pleasure out of this, or is it more the the figuring out the business yeah. and the environmental side that excites yeah. you? No, this is boring. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is like arugula farming. I can't go to the same bars anymore when I'm going to tell my story. It's like, I went out and I cut off some kelp, you know? A recent World Bank study found that a network of kelp farms spanning just under 5% of the U.S.'s coastal waters could remove the carbon equivalent of almost 95 million cars from the ocean each year. To get that going, Bren started a nonprofit called Green Wave, which helps entrepreneurs start their own kelp farm using his own as a model. And according to Bren, there's money to be made. In a single season, a farmer with a 10-acre plot of water can grow 200,000 pounds of kelp that can then be sold for a dollar a pound. Even though kelp is good for the environment, people aren't rushing to put it on their dinner plate. And strangely, that's something Bren relates to. 
Culturally, I haven't shifted. I eat at the gas station most nights. I'm not a foodie. I'll get there, but that cultural piece of a fisherman of like, yeah. you know, hunting, killing, and eating bad food yeah. is uh, is still with me. But you do eat this. You yeah, eat this yeah. on a regular basis, or? Uh, uh, uh no. No. <laughs> 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 Why not? My, my 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 wife eats it. I mean, I'm not a sea vegetable guy, right? right. I mean, again, I'm sure, a, I'm sure. A, you uh, like killing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> I farm it. The chefs will, will figure out how to how to get people to eat it. All right. So you're fighting against yourself. You're fighting against people like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you do that? How do you convince yourself to eat this on a regular basis? <laughs> well, I mean, there is a trajectory, right? Kale had a trajectory where right. it started in sort of you know the 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 exclusive, the celebrity chef world, and then it moved into a uh, really a, a middle class mainstay. I think we're going to make kelp the new kale. I just don't want to oversell saying oh everyone's going to eat this tomorrow. High-end restaurants in New York, however, have been serving Bren's kelp for years now. And his biggest client, Google, offers kelp to 6,000 employees at its New York City cafeteria. The goal of, of transition to a new economy isn't just job creation, isn't just like creating call center jobs. It's creating jobs, creating a life that you can still sing songs about. But yeah. you think people are still going to sing songs about this? It's going to move much more to like what the arugula farmers sing, which I have no idea what they <laughs> sing, right? Maybe it's acapella. I have mean, no idea. But never underestimate the power of, ha of self-direction, of agency. If I fail out here, it's okay. And no one tells me what to do. I can tell anybody to fuck off, and that's a fisherman. <laughs> That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, July 25th.